Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. But you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a good Monday so far. I want to give a very quick thank you to Harry, Amy, and Detective Doug for your donations. I appreciate you guys. Also, those of you that I met down at the Alec Murdoch trial, and I promised to send you some stickers and a few other goodies, I just got a new shipment of my stuff in. I got some cute little pins, and I'm waiting on some keychains. So it's coming. I haven't forgotten. Life's a little crazy. I leave Sunday for Boise, so this week is a mad rush between getting my doctor's appointments in. My kids have dentist appointments. My dogs have vet appointments. The cats have vet appointments. I've got to pack. I got to finish buying stuff. It's going to be insanity, but hey, I would rather be busy than not. Also, I want to tell you a little bit. It's really weird to think that we have listeners who don't know who Fruit Loop is. So those of you who are new to the podcast, Fruit Loop is my best friend of over 30 years. And we started this podcast the day they found the kids' bodies on Chad Daybell's property. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing. I had done true crime years before, got out of it for a few years. This case really intrigued me and brought me back in. But she left in July of last year to follow her calling, which is to provide a safe place for men, women, and children of domestic violence to get them out of danger and then to help them become self-sufficient to get their own place and to save lives and covering true crime. We know all too well what happens with domestic violence. It can end with somebody being murdered or a whole family being murdered. So this weekend, finally, it's about an hour away from here and they have no service up there. So we, we have not been able to keep in contact as much as we normally do since January, because that's when she made the move up to the property officially but I was able to go check it out, y'all. I'm so proud of Fruit Loop. It is amazing. They have already housed women and children in need, and they're just getting started. So I'm going to do a video of some of the property. Nothing identifiable in that property. It is very isolated, and we are going to keep it that way. But I really want to show you guys what she has done since she left the podcast. I'm so proud of her and Brianne, who... Uh, have started this just with a vision and a passion to help victims of domestic violence. I'm so proud. And then I will put a link in there. And if you are able and inclined to donate to this cause, they have a long way to go to reach their goal, but they are already making a difference in the lives of people who need it. So I'm just so proud. Music fact of the day, Madonna's Like a Prayer. Now, this song caused a lot of controversy. Religious groups across the world, including the Vatican, protested the video, saying that it showed blasphemy using Christian imagery. And they called for a national boycott of Pepsi because she performed it in a Pepsi commercial. And so also Pepsi's other companies that they own, which included KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut, were also called to be boycotted. Pepsi explained the difference between their advertisement and her artistic opinions in the video, and they gave in to the protest and canceled that advertising campaign with her. Pope John Paul II also got involved and encouraged fans to boycott the singer in Italy altogether. It is actually one of my favorite songs by her, but definitely very controversial. I think for a while it might have even been banned, like the video from being shown. So where are we now? All right, let's go through some crazy numbers. 1,355 days since Charles Vallow was murdered. 1,295 days since Tylee was murdered. 1,281 days since JJ was murdered. 1,255 days since Tammy Daybell was murdered. And 1,131 days ago, Lori Vallow was arrested in Hawaii. And today... Potential jurors will fill out questionnaires, the first step in seating a, jur a jury, and the long road to justice kind of makes a pit stop today. We're nearing the destination, y'all. So Sunday, I will be there Monday morning, bringing you guys the latest every night on this podcast. The episodes may be a little later coming out because I have to finish what I'm doing there, go back 
to my house up in Boise and get everything together. But I'm going to do my best to, to make it to where it's not 2 a.m. like Murdoch because the Wi-Fi should be much better. Thank goodness. All right. We left off, sadly, on the day J.J. Valley was murdered. September 24th is Tylee's 17th birthday, and there's nothing on social media for her, no happy birthdays that anybody could find. But Lori also unenrolled JJ from his school in Rexburg and tells JJ's school that he's going to be going to Louisiana with his grandparents and won't be home until October or maybe later. Lori also responds to that babysitter that she hired who asked about watching JJ. She was under the impression this would be an ongoing job for her. So Lori responds, hi, Sydney. I hope the wedding was good. So JJ's grandparents came this weekend and they took him for a few weeks to give me a break. So we won't be back until probably the end of October. I wish I had other work for you to do. You're such a darling girl. I understand if you need to get another job. A lot of people talk about mental illness and Lori, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I will say this. The links that she went to to cover everything up shows that what she did was wrong and what she was involved with was wrong. So that's kind of where I stand on all that. I have no doubt something's off with her, whether it's religious delusions or whatever, but you don't hide things like this when you are so far gone that you're not culpable. All right, September 25th, Alex's phone is pinged on Chad's property from 10.05 to 10.22 in the morning. That's about 17 minutes. It's as if Alex is in or around the house, but not near the locations where the kids' bodies were buried. Kay sends an email to Detective Moffat and says that Melanie lives next door to Lori in Rexburg and also says that they are ready to retain an attorney to get visitation with J.J. J.J.'s social worker from Arizona was helping them, and Kay said she wanted to catch Lori with her guard down. Kay says she texts and emails two to three times a week asking for visitation or at least a FaceTime with no luck. Now, Alex took the Jeep to a window tinting shop and had the front window tinted 20% and the rear window tinted 5%. Also, Brandon Boudreau moves into his new rental house. We are about to get into the portion of this story, this case, this crazy case where Brandon Boudreau was shot at by Alex Cox. Luckily, Alex was a crap shot unless you were just a few feet in front of him. Because he missed. And thank goodness he missed because Brandon has four beautiful kids and now a new wife and stepchildren. And it's sad to think what would have happened that day had Alex actually been successful. September 26, Melanie flies from Mesa, Arizona to Idaho Falls. Now, the same day, Alex activates a burner phone there in Rexburg. The number was connected to his Gmail account because, you know, dumb criminal. And thank goodness he was dumb because his Gmail account is what led authorities eventually to the bodies of JJ and Tylee. Also, eviction proceedings are filed against Alex in Santan Valley. If you remember, they emailed his landlord, said he had been in an accident and couldn't work and wouldn't be returning back to Arizona. September 26th through the 27th, in the Chandler document dump, they showed cell phone pings all around the BYUI campus. And they also show where Lori had connected to Wi-Fi, which uh, was at the townhomes. There was a ping across the highway that could have been the same cell phone tower, or she could have been somewhere across that highway. September 28th, Alex goes to Unified Sportsman's Gun Club. And I totally think that was some target practice for what was about to happen. Also, there is a text exchange between Colby and who he thought was Tylee. And he was growing concerned that Tylee hadn't called or FaceTime him in weeks. Now, this is four days after Tylee's birthday. It says, from Colby, hey, Ty, happy birthday. I'm so proud of you. I know you've been through a lot. Trust God. It's going to be okay. Someone answers, thanks, Colbs. I love you. Colby says, hey, Ty, are you okay? There's a response. I'm good. Just tired. Call you back later. Love you. Colby says, okay, call me tonight, please. There's a response from Tylee's phone. At the movie, I'll call you after. Colby says, please call me after your movie. I'm worried about you. The response, worried about me, what? Colby says, just want to hear you talk. The response says, okay, this week was busy. I'll call you soon. Colby says, please call me tonight if you can. Here's a question that I have. And 
you have to wonder what, what was going through all their minds because at some point, Kay and Larry, Colby, other family members of JJ and Tylee are going to want to see these kids. Did they really think the world was going to end and this would be a non-issue? Or were they just so blinded by everything that they wanted selfishly that they didn't care? So September 29th, Melanie's flies to Mesa, Arizona from Idaho Falls. Now, Alex must have driven her to the airport because his car was near the airport at 3.05 p.m. and her flight was at 4.10. Those two become buddy-buddy here soon. Late September, a neighbor's child went to the townhouse to see if JJ could play, but Lori told that child that JJ went to go stay with his grandparents. September 30th, from 11.31 to 1.16 p.m., Alex's phone is in Lori's apartment. Now, at 12.34, his phone receives a call from Chad Daybell's burner phone. From 1.17 to 4.32 p.m., Alex's phone is pinged at his apartment. At 6.01 p.m. that same day on the 30th, his cell phone is pinged in Lori's apartment and it stays there until October 3rd. And this is all obviously 2019. So what it is, I think, this established an alibi for him that was really not thought out well. Uh, it goes to the temple one day and Alex had lost his temple recommend because he had been excommunicated. So they forgot about that, huh? So here is a map of where Alex traveled from to go try to murder Brandon Boudreaux. It is a 14-ish hour drive, I guess probably more depending on stops from Rexburg to Gilbert, Arizona. The Jeep is seen at 8.10 p.m. on the 30th on I-15 near Blackfoot, Idaho. The next day, Melanie's stops the divorce proceedings with Brandon, which is kind of sketchy because... Brandon would be shot at two days later. You have to wonder, is this allegedly for life insurance purposes? Now, also at the end of September, Chad and Julie Rowe talk about Tammy's pending death. Julie Rowe told Fox 13 now in December of 2019 when all this started hitting the news. Three weeks before Tammy's death, Julie Rowe and Chad called each other. I asked him, do you still see Tammy dying? And he said, yes, I do. Tammy was in charge of the finances and also the covers for the books that Chad wrote. They were a partnership in that company. And Chad said he wanted to get out of the book business, but Tammy wanted to keep going. Chad told Julie Rowe, I'm ready to get out now. And Tammy doesn't want to get out. When she passes, I'm done. I can't keep doing this. Let me tell you all about our sponsor of the week, Pros. There's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care, and that's because your hair and your hair goals are completely unique. My hair is dry and frizzy. I wanted to get rid of these problems. Thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say I've never been in more love with my hair. First, pros asked me for my hair goals, which was smoother hair with color protection. Their in-depth consultation also asks about you as a person. Pros asked me really unexpected things like my age, hair length, do I get split ends, and even my zip code so that pros can factor in the environment my hair lives in. Next, Pros analyzed all my answers and handpicked clean ingredients to help me reach my hair goals. I used the Scalp Remedy, Clarify and Cleanse Color Extending Shampoo, and the Smoothing Solution Volume Building Conditioner. I also used the Boar's Hairbrush that makes my hair super smooth. My hair is completely different, the frizz is gone, and it's so much softer. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive pros is the best care hair you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. And now it's time for a word for our sponsor of the week, Lomi by Pila. Look, I've never been able to compost before. It's always too complicated, too much work, and it's too stinky. Then I got a Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week, down from four bags to two, by the way, and I feel great knowing I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. I have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. So what can you put in Lomi? Food leftovers, fruits and vegetables, eggs and eggshells, grains, coffee grounds, yard trimmings, house plants, and more. 
If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use the promo code what the world to get your $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to lomi.com slash what the world and use promo code what the world at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. So you see three weeks. He's already pinging her as dead. October 1st, Melanie and Brandon close on their marital home and the new owners actually sign that document on the 3rd. The same day on October 1st, Lori rents a storage locker in Rexburg, Idaho, where she stores, I don't even want to say store, she discards really sentimental belongings of JJ's and Tylee's. We'll get to that in a little bit. The cost of that is $53 a month. The unit is a 10 by 10, and she uses the name Lori Ryan when reserving that storage unit. Lori's mom, Janice, tells CBS News that she spoke to JJ on this day. Now, when she gave that interview, she provided a phone bill that supposedly showed the call. I've always wondered if maybe it was Alex making himself sound like JJ because he was good at doing impersonations or allegedly was Janice covering for her daughter. Not sure which one. And I don't know that we will ever know. Also, in an email, investigators note that on this date, Lori was searching for wedding dresses and other information online prior to Tammy's death. Also on October 1st, the Jeep that was driven by Alex in the attempted murder of Brandon is seen on I-40 driving towards the Phoenix metro area with the rear tire missing. This was 26 hours and 30 minutes prior to the attempt on his life. Now, I have a video that I uploaded onto YouTube that I will put in the description of this episode where I demonstrate why this back tire had to be removed in order for Alex to take the shot at Brandon the way he did. Also, the seats in the back are removable in Jeeps. That was removed. There are also some calls between Alex and Chad in the morning and in the evening. They talk from 7.31 to 7.48 and then... At 7.52, Alex looks for Brandon's new home online. On October 2nd, Lori buys the wedding rings that her and Chad would exchange at their wedding in November. Now, keep in mind, Tammy would not be murdered for another 17 days. She has bought these wedding rings. Eventually, Charles' sister, Kay, logs into his account and finds these purchases, which opens things up that something very nefarious has happened and is still happening. Also, on this day, on October the 2nd, Brandon is shot at in Gilbert, Arizona. Now, don't laugh at my graphic here, y'all. I'll always have a link in the description to the website which shows these videos. I could not get these cars to not look like they were floating. In an email to investigators in August, a family member said that Brandon spent a lot of time with Charles, and when he heard Alex killed Charles, he was scared he was next. So at 7.17 a.m., Alex searches for directions again to Brandon's home from the location he's currently at and Alex was at a temple in Gilbert, Arizona. 7.19 a.m., Alex heads towards Brandon's home. At 7.25 in the morning, Brandon leaves the home with his four kids. They're young kids. He drops the three older kids at school and then exchanges the youngest kid with Melanie's. He decides to go to the gym afterwards. So at 8.02 a.m., Alex's cell phone, which was in Rexburg, as we know, not the burner phone. He has a burner phone while he's doing the dirty deeds, but that regular cell phone of Alex's, it, it texts Lori's cell phone number, and it has a 20-minute call with her cell phone. So at 914, Brandon returns home, and he is shot at. The shot hits at Brandon's driver's side front window, and it shatters the glass, and the bullet was just inches above his head. I mean, Talk about lucky. This is one of the luckiest dudes walking the earth because it was inches from him being victim number five in this terrible, terrible case. Obviously, Brandon calls 911. So from 919 until 925 a.m., the burner phone with Alex is traveling away from Brandon's and calls Chad's burner phone two times. 
So officers make contact with Brandon and we're going to go back to my, my cheesy little picture here. He said, as he pulled into his driveway, he noticed the green colored Jeep parked the wrong way, just West of his home. The rear window of the Jeep rose up and he saw the barrel of some type of firearm pointed at his car. Then he hears a loud bang. So he's still making the turn when that shot was fired. So he straightened his car out and got the heck out of Dodge. While on the call with 911, he watched the direction the Jeep was traveling in and followed it until he lost sight. Responding units were advised to look for that Jeep. They never found it. It seems like these people were always just one step ahead and they got lucky at times. And then sometimes their planning just bought them time. But in this case, you would think if this Jeep is in Gilbert or heading towards the interstate or something, man, why didn't they catch it? We could have just had him before he mysteriously drops over dead later in what they say is natural. I call hogwash. But on the call, he said he was going to drive back home and waited on officers to arrive. So when police came, they saw Brandon standing in the driveway, waving them down. The first police officer that got there noticed the side glass window laying in the driveway. And also Brandon was visibly upset. The officer noticed that bullet hole in the driver's side top door jam and it checked the interior, didn't find an exit hole. The officer asked why the window glass was laying in the driveway and Brandon had a Tesla and those doors open automatically when the car is put in park. And so when it opened, the glass just fell out. He said he didn't touch anything and he only heard one gunshot. He didn't recognize the driver, but thought he saw Texas license plates, which would have matched Charles's Jeep that actually Tylee was driving up until she was murdered. He had only been in this home for a week. And told officers that he was in the process of getting a divorce. He told them the reason for the divorce, which we talked about. Um, he said that he had some issues with her family. Also, let them know a homicide with Charles had recently occurred. He said he tried to reconcile with Melanie's, but it didn't work. So they collected bullet fragments from the doorframe, but the majority of the bullet was never located. They think when he slammed on the gas to get out of there, it just fell out and they never recovered it. Glass was also found in the street in the area where Brandon said he was hit and it totally matched the trajectory matched where he said that Jeep was parked and then where he was when he got hit. Investigators also located a tire track imprint in dust and debris also at the spot where that Jeep was parked. Now, they talked to some neighbors. A witness saw a small grayish colored Jeep the night before between 8 and 8.30 drive by that house twice. That is so scary. I mean, he has his children there. And what if Alex had been there when he's bringing his kids out? I fully think Alex would have taken that shot, could have either hit one of the four kids. I mean, those kids could have seen their dad get murdered. It's These people are just sick. Also, another neighbor and her husband saw the Jeep driving down the street that morning between 7.45 and 8. Another neighbor saw the Jeep parked nose to nose with a white van around 8.40 a.m. The Jeep was running and this neighbor couldn't see inside due to the tinted windows. One neighbor's ring cam caught the rear end of the Jeep going down the road at 913. And then one witness noticed that Jeep still parked nose to nose. This witness was walking their dog and the Jeep was running. The driver's seat was pushed all the way forward to the steering wheel, but they didn't see anyone inside. On this photo, on the left, this is Charles's actual Jeep. But these other four photos are stock photos. And I just wanted to demonstrate why that rear seat had to be removed. Alex was a tall guy. And obviously, even with the seats folded down, he would not have been level to try to take the shot. So he had to remove the back seat in order to try and do that. Now, here's what's interesting. Lori and Chad are seen on surveillance at the storage unit at 2.25 p.m. Chad is seen pulling out the tire from the back of the Jeep and he rolls it into the storage unit. They're also seen putting that rear seat into that storage unit. Now, as they're leaving, remind you, Tammy Daybell still alive and well. Chad on camera gives her a little booty pat. Lori and Chad stay about seven minutes 
And again, I will post the link to that video with my Jeep demonstrating why that back tire needed to be removed in order for him to raise that back glass like Brandon said he saw. So what does Lori, Chad, and Alex do at some point after the shooting? These morons search for shootings in Gilbert. Now, just a random fact. When Melanie's dad asked her about the attempt on Brandon. Melanie said, quote, how do you know he didn't shoot his own vehicle, end quote. And how do you know one of his work buddies didn't shoot at him? She allegedly told others that Brandon made up this attempt on his life as a plot against her and accused him of shooting his own car. In an interview with Dateline, Melanie is asked about the shooting and Keith Morrison asks her, did you ask Alex if he tried to shoot Brandon? Melanie said, I did. And she laughs. She said flat out, just said, Alex, like, you know, what happened with that? He made some jokes about it. And then we both talked about how insane that would be for him across the street with a rifle in broad daylight in a recognizable car. Keith Morrison asked, did he ever actually deny it? Melanie said, uh, yeah. Now, what's interesting is in this video, she's shaking her head no as she's saying, um, yeah. She said he denied it many times. October 3rd, the Jeep returns to the Idaho Falls area at some point. And at 2.11 p.m., Lori and Alex visit the storage unit. They stay for four minutes. Alex gets the tire and the rear seat from the unit and puts it in Lori's car. Also, Zulema texts Alex, how are you doing? He responds, wow, nice. Just waiting and laughing and singing. Are you coming up soon? So on October 3rd, Melanie is interviewed by Gilbert PD about this attempt on Brandon's life. Now, she brought her youngest child with her. Huge red flag to me. She never asked why she's being brought in. Uh, that'd be the first thing I would ask if, if a police officer brings me into an interrogation room is, why am I here? But just a few notes from her police interview. I'm not going to dive in super deep. She starts off telling the investigator why she's divorcing. She gives the bogus story about her suspicions about Brandon. Melanie said she could not remember what she did after Brandon dropped their youngest off the day before. She also received multiple calls from Brandon, which isn't normal. He texted her he had a bad day and wanted to check on their kids. She responded the next morning at 6.52 a.m. that the kids were fine and she hoped his day was better. She can't remember also if she talked to anyone else on the day Brandon was shot at. When she was told someone tried to kill Brandon the day before, the investigator said she had no change of expression and stayed quiet. When asked if she knew of anyone who would want to kill Brandon, she said he had a bunch of friends and she didn't know who they were. And then she goes into the murder of Charles with the whole self-defense story. Melanie's denied knowing the specific location of where Lori and Alex were and refused to give the investigator their phone numbers because she said she was told People could track phones and use listening devices to gather information. At the end of the interview, she did ask if Brandon was okay. And the investigator said he's alive, although she knew that because she said he just texted her. And the detective notes after his interview with Melanie's, his suspicions about her involvement were increased. Now, it should be noted, she has not been charged with anything related to the attempt on Brandon. Neither has Chad. It seems like they're placing all the blame on Alex, who is dead as a doornail. Tammy Daybell's family told East Idaho News that Chad told Tammy her deceased grandma Cooper visited him and said she needed to go visit her parents in Springville, Utah. She had mentioned earlier in the week she wanted to come up, but she was kind of hesitant to go, which maybe makes me think she's worried about leaving Chad if she has suspicions about this affair. Because from what we've heard from Melanie Gibb, not only was she suspicious, she confronted Chad about it. So she never really traveled alone, but the next day she did go. On October 4th, Lori receives a text from an unknown person. The text was deleted, but investigators were able to recover it. It said, I said it wrong. The LDS woman who is an expert in all the feast days of the Hebrews that the Lord sent me to find through a dream didn't tell me the bride had to be the first to be symbolically translated before the 144,000. She said that the marriage feast always represented to the Hebrews the first resurrection. And the Lord had told her by the Spirit it would be at Adam on the Amon. 
I hope I got that right. I'm going to show you guys a picture. This is in Missouri. This is where Lori would eventually travel uh, to visit. Apparently, this is the place where it all began. And the bride had to be the first one resurrected in the first resurrection before the rest of her people, the 144,000, could. And because she had to cleanse for her ancestor's sins and their ancestor's sins as feminine sacrifice in order for the church of the firstborn to be born. So an interpretation of this message would suggest that this was where Lori had to go to become translated and fulfill the beliefs of the church of the firstborn. Lori would travel to this place on October 11th of 2019. Remember, we talked about the person that she texted in the Walgreens that was going to show her all the amazing sites. This is one of the amazing sites I assume she was referring to. All right. So October 4th, Tammy visits her parents in Springville, Utah. But Chad to also had told Zulema that Tammy would die on this trip in a car wreck. When she didn't die, of course, she became a zombie. Her sister said on Dateline when she learned Tammy was coming alone, to visit that was very odd to her tammy's family said when she was visiting she seemed fine she did some zumba classes a clogging class she was dancing in the living room and seemed healthy now chad and Lori text also on this day investigators did recover them they had been deleted so october 4th 746 a.m from chad to Lori. thank you for sending me that paragraph beautiful lily she's got a new name it's lily I'm eager to see you soon, trying to hasten her departure, meaning Tammy. I love you endlessly. There was a lips emoji, a heart, and fire. Chad must be obsessed with Harry Potter because Harry's mom was Lily. And remember, he said he felt like Harry Potter. So the next day, October 5th, from Chad to Lori at 3.25 a.m. Hello, sweet angel. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you're awake and can talk. I love you. Heart and lips emoji. One minute later, Chad texts, the short version is that she's been switched. Tammy is in limbo. A level three demonic entity named Viola is in her body. It happened about 10 p.m. and was done by Tammy's sister, who I always knew was a three dark, but it turns out she is multiple creation. At 3.44 a.m., he says, Viola has been attached for about a year to my niece, who is 12, by the way. I have connected with Tammy in limbo and she's very frustrated and upset. She wants Viola removed as soon as possible. Viola seems to be similar to Penelope. The personality differences from Tammy should be evident quickly. Please seek a confirmation on this, but I've now checked three times since I got home and get more affirmative answers each time. Then at 3.54 a.m., he texts her, not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. Tammy drives back to Rexburg. Now, someone takes a photo of Alex Cox at Mesa Falls while he is taking pictures. He also visits the storage unit alone in his silver pickup truck. He would return to that unit five other times between this day and October 26th. October 7th at 104, Lori's sister Summer texted and asked if she knew anything about what she called the Tesla incident. That would be the attempt on Brandon's life. Summer said an incident that is suppo that supposedly happened to Brandon sounds highly suspicious. Lori says, Brandon's Tesla or the Tesla company? Summer says, Brandon's. He's claiming someone shot at him and shot the window to his Tesla a few days ago. Police are looking into it. Now, also on this day, those wedding rings that Lori bought were delivered to the townhome in Rexburg. Now, October 8th, investigators note the day before Tammy was shot at, Chad only communicated with Alex on his burner phone and Lori's regular phone. Chad's phone was pinged at the townhomes at 1.20 p.m. on the 8th, and it stayed an hour. Also, when things go down, what does Lori do? She gets the heck out of Dodge. She takes an Allegiant flight from Idaho Falls to Phoenix at 9.58 a.m. Again, using the name Lori Ryan from her third husband, Joe Ryan. Also, Lori texts someone she is at the dealership trading her car. Between October 8th and 12th, Alex conducted multiple internet searches related to a Grindel drop and shooting through a Dodge Dakota.
October 9th, Alex gets another burner phone. He travels from the Sportsman Warehouse, which is that shooting place, I believe, or where you can get, get ammo and stuff, to the vicinity of the Daybell residence. Tammy is shot at by Alex in her own driveway after returning home from a church function. She posted about it on Facebook, actually. I have a, a screen grab of that up right now. It says, okay, neighbors, something really weird just happened, and I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in front of our driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was, and he never spoke even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. I was about to smack him with my freezer meals from enrichment tonight when I decided to yell for Chad instead. Now, on Dateline, her sister said that Tammy said she kind of went after Alex. In an email chain from investigators, they place Alex and Chad's phone in Rexburg around the time of the attempt on her life. Lori, of course, she's staying with Melanie's in Arizona. Chad went to the townhomes. So in the Gilbert documents for the attempt on Brandon, we got the Chandler document dump, which was about Charles's murder. And then the Gilbert document dump was centered around the attempt on Brandon's life. It says, based on evidence gathered and processed, it identifies Chad as the facilitator and Alex as the shooter. October 9th, Tammy filed a police report about the shooting in her driveway. Sheriff Lynn Humphreys said at the time, investigators believed this was a prank and they never found the person. Now, some of the neighbors said it was super freezing cold that night. They were using spotlights, looking around to see if they could find anybody. But they kind of didn't feel like it was a prank just because of how cold it was there. In an email between investigators on March 6th of 2020, they confirmed they have some doorbell camera footage from that night on the 9th. They also send a redacted almost full page of cell phone interactions from that day between Lori, Chad and Alex. So at 11, 11 p.m., Alex sends a text to Zulema and they talk on the phone for 38 minutes, which is out of the ordinary for them since they don't usually communicate late at night. So that's the end of this episode. I wanted to get through this attempt on Brandon as well as Tammy because things are happening so fast now. The kids have been murdered. They're buried. So what's standing in the way? Well, Charles is murdered. So Brandon's still alive. Tammy Daybell's still alive. And what happens to Tammy and Brandon? They both get shot at by Alex Cox, who, thank goodness, did not hit either one of them. Although, unfortunately, the next episode, we will cover the murder of Tammy Daybell. We don't officially know a cause of death for Tammy Daybell. I imagine that's going to come out at this trial. Lori's charged with conspiracy to commit murder in her case, not murder. Chad is charged with the actual murder. So anyways, next episode, we are going to cover the murder of Tammy Daybell. And then things really start speeding up from here. Towards the end, I'm going to update from what has been going on in the last couple of weeks in Lori's case. There's been a lot of action. And then I'll be heading to Boise. And then and starting a week from today, you'll be getting updates from Boise, Idaho, when the actual jury selection is scheduled to start one week from today. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you have a good rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.